Good morning. This is Jason Dean coming at you again for Film Fanatic. Going to be doing a show on a movie that I've been wanting to do for a very, very long time. It's a movie that's been uh, talked about many, many times. It's one of those movies I, you know, often would think about, well, what else could I add to it? You know, what else could I add to the... Uh, the commentary around this film, one of the most talked about films. But, but before we start, or before I start doing the show, it's a, uh, it's a beautiful Sunday here. It's Mother's Day, and um, beautiful weather. The weather was it. It's so it's it's such a complicated thing sometimes living here in Mid Coast Maine. It's you know I always tell people. Um, it's the most beautiful place on earth during the summer and springtime. And I love one of the allures around, well, probably, probably the thing I love the most about living here in Maine. You have, there's a really great community here, uh, a really amazing collection of artists musicians and people doing all kinds of things in the arts it's it's pretty staggering and always uh surprising to me even though i've lived here for a long time the amount of of art that's going on in this area so many great musicians so many great talent so many talents there's a lot of great bands and a lot of and then especially the last five to seven years i've seen a lot of original artists come to the to the fold where they're they're doing and presenting their own material which to me is like really inspiring and also that there's been a shift in local venues to where it seems like those groups can can perform their own material it, they can get away with not having to rely you know, especially on, you know, playing other people's material for, you know, three hours. There's, that's still very much a thing, but it's, it's, there's a, I feel like there's been a big opportunity that's happened over time here where now that there, there are venues and places that will have local artists that are doing original material and it's really, uh, a nice shift I think and a nice change because at the end of the day those artists you know covers are great and you know and that's still a thing but it's you know at the end of the day it's the calling card the ultimate calling card by those artists and, and bands I still I play in a band right now that's all covers and it's a lot of fun and we do lots of uh, you know older tunes some funk tunes and and it's a lot of fun and it's more of a party band but and there's a lot of jamming also but it's primarily a cover band and that band seems to be doing pretty well as far as you know gaining an audience but outside of that most of the things that I'm involved in and with are all like original based things so it's always really cool but you know so you have that for me that's a you know probably the biggest thing here but the weather too is is during this time of year is usually really great, but it's also uh, totally chaotic. Totally chaotic. I had two shows recently where uh, the forecast was pretty good, chance of showers, and but the weather on Friday we had a show. We had a quantum show at the Poor Farm, and the weather was pretty chaotic. It was a beautiful day for for a while, and then it it got really stormy. Uh, super windy and really uncomfortable and then we got attacked by swarms of mosquitoes and we uh, got rained on twice and we had to stop nothing none of our equipment got destroyed and and you know nothing in that area happened luckily it was still we still ended up playing and and it was a, a really fun show we got to play you know uh, some new material that we've been working on with quantum and to me, like I've said before, that's always my favorite thing to do to just kind of test things out, see how they flow in a real life setting. I learn in in that in that area or in that kind of a space more than any other space because 
you know, you, you just see if, you know, you take something out of the practice space or something out of your head and you say, you have this idea that you think clicks and then uh, you take it to, a, you know, a real life place with, with an audience or whatever and see if it actually works. And sometimes, you know, it doesn't, you have that kind of revelation moment of where it doesn't really work or maybe it needs this or that. And then you have other moments of where, oh, okay, this is like, this is, you know, got, this is viable. This is something that can work and it's cool. And you develop it from there. And that's kind of how I, I think about that band and that material is it's always developing over time. But the live setting to me is my favorite setting. I love recording and, and all those other things. But the live setting to me, it's also the biggest challenge. But at the end of the day, it's the biggest uh, learning uh, situation for me and being able to test out new material. But the weather was totally chaotic and uh, just, you know, crazy all over the place. And it got, after it rained the second time, it got really buggy and mosquitoes came out and I got eaten alive. And I was just like, Jesus, what is going on here? And the whole day, you know, leading up to the gig and when I got there early to set up, it was, you know, picture perfect out. But within a couple hours, it just shifted. And then it got really humid. It was really strange. And then yesterday, I had a gig with Electric Bonfire and we played. And again, it was it was that same kind of thing of where the forecast all week was really, really nice. It was supposed to be in the 70s and pretty clear, uh, clear, clear blue skies and, and everything. And uh, so it looked great. It looked, you know, the, at least the forecast. And it was our first time playing at Lake St. George Brewing, which is a brew pub, uh, which is an amazing spot. Uh, really out. It's an outdoor brew pub. They have this uh, beautiful location. It's in the woods. It's right by Lake St. George. It's, it's uh, you know, just a tremendous place. And it's uh, pretty close. It's only about 15 minutes away or so from my house. And I remember... On my way to go to the gig to set up, I had stopped in Belfast to do, uh, to, you know, run a couple errands or whatever. And it was pretty hot. It was super clear out, really nice. It was uh, 75 degrees, you know, and I didn't bring, uh, I didn't really bring a jacket or, you know, a hat or, or anything because I figured, uh, you know, it's going to be pretty warm. And, uh, and then I got to the venue and then we started setting up. I got there on the, a little bit on the earlier side and about, I don't know, 15 or 15 minutes or so into after we got done setting up more or less, it got super windy, super uber windy and the temperature started dropping. By the time we, we started playing, it was cold and we played two sets. We played till about eight, a little bit after eight. It was freezing. It was freezing cold and it was super windy. Uh, at one point, I couldn't feel my hands, and it was freezing. And I actually, at one point, took a break. When we went on band break, I actually went into my car and turned my car on and turned the heat on. And I'm just like, what the fuck? It was one of those moments where I was like, you know, I got really frustrated. And I'm like, why does anybody live here? Why why do people live here in Maine? Because this weather sucks. And I'm... And I usually am not one to, to say that or take that position, but it was like really frustrating. And I'm like, it's springtime. We're about like two months or so into springtime and the weather, like for the most part is good, but kind of sucks. And it was freezing and it got down to the thirties last night. And I was just like, what the fuck? Like it was so surprising and just frustrating. And I know, I know like one person that I used to play music with years ago he always, he lived in Belfast and he always complained about the weather, even during the summer. Because we live in a coastal area, so the weather does change and shift quite a bit. And he couldn't stand it, so he moved to South Carolina. He's been down there ever since, where it's consistently warm. And But it's just like days, days like that or weather patterns like that make me think of like, why am I here? You know, it's, I don't know. But anyway, so today's show is about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Very excited to talk about the show. I did a big show last year on Stanley Kubrick, who is by far uh, my favorite, favorite director of all time. 
to me, he's a god. He's a source of inspiration. Not only do I love his movies to death, but I also feel like, and also, you know, his films are such a huge source of inspiration for me, uh, for my music that I write, my weird music that I write, and for my band Quantum. But his whole, like, way of operating, uh, his whole way of how his whole, you know, his the way his whole aesthetic was, his whole mindset the way he created for me is like one of the greatest inspirations so it like influences me uh personally you know just just my general like philosophy and then also especially my music that i write i'm really influenced by by his by his films greatly and you know one of the quotes that's always stuck with me by Stanley Kubrick. And I've talked about it before, but um, his last movie that he directed, and this is a quote I like, I, it's a, ever since I heard it, it, it always stuck with me and really was kind of this profound thing and it was really inspiring. And every now and then when I have a talk, you know, talk with a friend or talk to somebody about movies and we end up talking about Kubrick, a lot of the times I bring this up. But a few years back, well, quite a few years back, his last movie that he directed before he uh, passed away a little too, you know, he, he passed away too young. He still had a few movies in him. He was in his 70s when he passed away. He was getting up there in age, but he still had all kinds of fire, I think, left in his, uh, you know, in his ability as a filmmaker and a storyteller. So I think he left the, you know, he left the planet prematurely. But his last movie that he directed was Eyes, Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, which is um, an, an, just an amazing movie. I think it's a masterpiece. And it was it was his last film that he directed. And I did see that in the theater. When uh, when that movie came out, or I, mean, I remember the few years, there was like two years or so before Eyes Wide Shut had come out, there... Uh, I remember I remember hearing about it and that this was going to be some really dark and mysterious kind of a, uh, of a film. And it starred, you know, Tom Cruise, which, you know, even now, well, probably even more so now since Maverick's been, Top Gun Maverick has just like set the world on fire, which is actually a really awesome movie. But especially during that time, uh, you know, more or less Tom Cruise was at the height of his power and and Nicole Kidman, who's actually one of my favorite actresses, one of my favorite actresses of all time. Um, they were married at the time, and it was a big announcement that they were both going to be in this film. So there was a lot of press around that and all this kind kind of a thing. But uh, and it's an amazing film. I and I remember seeing it in the in the theater, and I was just completely blown away. It was the only Kubrick movie I saw in the theater when it was when it was a, a new film, uh, so it was uh, you know an amazing experience, one of the most powerful movie going experiences I ever had, and I love that movie to death. I and I, so a few years back I bought Eyes Wide Shut on Blu-ray, and uh, because it was Kubrick's last film, that that special edition of Eyes Wide Shut. There's a tremendous amount of special features. There's all kinds of interviews. There's interviews with Stanley Kubrick's wife and his family. It's a real personal kind of look into his life. And they interview all the folks that worked with him throughout the years and on all of the all of the films. He Stanley Kubrick worked with pretty much the same crew since he started throughout all of his movies. He always had a sense of loyalty. Um, to his crew and and then vice versa the crew always had a sense of loyalty to to him and Stanley Kubrick you know his career you know was going on for decades you know but there is this quote he uh, the last I think it came I think it was maybe a year or so before Stanley Kubrick uh, had released Eyes Wide Shut, and he passed away shortly before the actual film, so it was actually not that long 
before he passed away. But he Hollywood had given him, uh, I believe it was like the Lifetime Achievement Award. They gave him this big award, and it was a big show in Hollywood. And Stan Kubrick was there, and he came out and gave uh, like an, an, a speech, an acceptance speech. And one of the things that he said in it was, you know, he came out and he thanked everyone and, and named people that he, you know, that he that he uh, really loved and people that he, you know, his family and and all the people that worked with him on all his films. But he said he he brought up the the mythological tale that we've all heard for years and years that has always been a source of inspiration for many for many people and has always been part of our mythology and that is the the flight of Icarus and he was talking about the flight of Icarus like he felt initially like a lot of people look at that tale as a cautionary tale where Icarus's character basically uh, you know acquires this power and and flies too close to the sun meaning that he has t so much power and he's willing to risk life and limb or even death for his art and then he eventually flies too close to the sun and perishes and it's you know essentially the way I look at it in the way our culture kind of looks at that tale and it's a you know a great myth is that it's a cautionary tale that you know if you uh if you have a vision or a desire for whether it's something in your life personally a personal thing or something you want to achieve whether it's uh something artistic or you know something um that is like a material thing that if you you know if you reach out too far and you you know basically if you spread yourself out too far or too thin and push yourself too much that could ultimately be your demise and he was talking about this this tale in a totally different light and he said that, well the problem with Icarus when he flew too close to the sun was that he should have had better wings and then he would have survived and he would have lived to 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 fight another day and i always felt that that was one of the most inspiring things he's ever said and that always stuck with me always stuck with me of of the idea of like how far you can push yourself for what you desire or for what you're creating And the idea of being, the idea being that you're, it's a, it's a unlimited process. You, you find another way to achieve and to, to raise yourself to that other apex or apex. But I always thought that was so ins inspirational and because it's always regarded as a cautionary tale, but Stanley Kubrick, again, uh, you know, I did a whole big show on him. He started out as a as a photographer and he was a professional chess player. He always had a really unique vision to all of his film his films. I always whenever I watch his films I've always felt it's like uh, I could see the influence of chess and his <coughs> background as a photographer. Cuz visually everything in his films and every frame of his films there there it's a uh, it's a piece of art. It's just so beautiful to look at. And and then I always always feel like I've always felt like his chess background you know with the idea of using a real methodical approach to to your next step. I always felt like I could see that in his films. Like everything was so methodical and so meticulous. And each step led to the next one and, and created 
something that was truly like the sum of all of its parts. And it was always a lot of strategy. And I always felt like that's those two things where you took that kind of influence from, from chess and in a visual sense from photography gave him such a unique vision, unlike unlike any other director. You know, and his body of work is, you know, unbelievable. I mean, you have 2001 A Space Odyssey, of course, came out in 1968, which is always mind-boggling to me how, how many years ago that came out. Today's show is about The Shining. That came out in 1980. Clockwork Orange, 71, another masterpiece. Of course, Eyes Wide Shut. And it's hard to believe that came out 23 years ago. That was... It's, it's mind-boggling. Like, that's how long he's been gone. Uh, and that came out in 1999. Full Metal Jacket, another just incredible movie. 1987. Arguably probably the greatest war movie ever made. Doctor Strange Love, of course. What what else can be said about that masterpiece? That came out in 1964. Barry Lyndon, which is another masterpiece for Kubrick. I also, I also feel it. it's a movie that is pretty underrated, underrated and pretty underappreciated for the most part. Also, Lolita, which came out in 1962, which, out of all of his amazing films, might be my second favorite. I I love that movie. It's one of my favorite books by Nabokov, and that movie in that book are just incredible. Highly, highly controversial uh, of its time, and even now, because it does essentially deal with, you know, where the main character is a pedophile. But just one of the darkest journeys as far as a viewer into such a taboo subject, but such an, an amazing film, such an amazing book, uh, one of my all-time favorite books. I, have, uh, I, rem- I remember having an experience of where, you know, I had told a friend, this is going back quite a few years, but I had told a friend, you know, we were talking about Kubrick and I was saying, yeah, you know, Lolita's one of my favorite movies, if not my... The Shining's my favorite overall, and then Lolita is is really close to right behind that, or almost virtually tied. But I... Uh, in, and my friend at the time had never read Lolita and had never seen the movie. And I, uh, I've read the book a few times. You know, again, it's one of my all-time favorite novels. And I remember giving it to her. I was like, you should definitely check this out. Like, this is classic, classic literature. One of the greatest, you know, books ever written. And the movie is, is incredible. And uh, she could not get through it. She she thought it was uh, disgusting. And she, she gave it back to me. Um, so she never finished it and uh, never watched the movie. Because it's, you know, you know it's uh, very controversial. Passive Glory, which came out in 1967, which is... You know, again, one of the greatest uh, war movies ever made. Just incredible. Spartacus in 1960, which also, as well as Passive Glory, starred Kirk Douglas. Spartacus is the only movie, and I think it's a great movie. I love that movie, too. Even though Kubrick was really at odds with that film, and he really, he was really uh, struggling at the time with the studios, and the studios really wanted to... There was a uh, during the making of that movie. There was a, a big battle for control over that film, and the studio really wanted to have more control over Kubrick's vision, and Kubrick really wasn't having that, and it create created all this tension. And also, Kirk Douglas and him were notoriously at odds with each other during that entire filming of that movie. It was marred down in lots of reshoots. The sh- the actual shoot for the film went on for a very long time. There were things that were being cut left and right, and Kubrick actually reached a point during uh, when that film was done that he actually wanted his name removed from the movie. and And I've seen interviews with Kubrick, and he even says that he doesn't really consider that to be one of his films. It, very interesting. But I, you know, I have Spartacus on Blu-ray, and I. I love that movie. I think it's an incredible movie, even though it was marred in all kinds of controversy at the time, uh, you know, with him being so at odds with the studio and fighting with the studios and the executives. And but and in another film that he did, which I, yeah, I believe was his first movie, and, uh, and that's called The Killing. 
And that is an incredible movie also. Just uh, a real dark, kind of film noir, uh, you know, uh, just a, like a classic American film noir. Such a great movie. And then also, uh, Killer's Kiss. Actually, I, I, I'm, I, I made a mistake. Killer's Kiss actually came out before... 1955, which is, and that movie also is just uh, an amazing film. Another real gritty kind of crime, film noir uh, kind of aesthetic behind that movie. But just, you know, the thing with Kubrick, too, is like his body of work, all of his films, like, I've talked about that before, where certain directors, you know, they don't have really necessarily a, a consistent body of work where every film is just a masterpiece some you know things happen of where you know a director changes his vision or maybe decides to go in more of a commercial route or just kind of loses that fire and you know i think two examples of that would be one of the biggest ones for me at least is ridley scott and also Brian De Palma, two directors that made have made some just incredible masterpieces uh, in film, just incredible films, and particularly in their early part of their career. But some some way, but if you look at their whole body of work, there I feel like there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of hit or misses. There, it's kind of all over the place. Uh, you know, where like you have someone say, well, Brian De Palma, where, you know, you have incredible films like Carrie or, you know, uh, Fury, Body Double, all these incredible movies, Dressed to Kill that he made earlier in his career. And then he, you know, in the 90s, he made films like uh, Mission to Mars, which are, which is kind of awful. And you wonder like what happened during that time span to, to that his it felt like his vision or something went completely askew and then i think the same thing with ridley scott where you know again he's responsible for some of the greatest movies alien you know just an incredible sci-fi horror movie you know one of the greatest of all time blade runner just incredible and then he you know went on to make you know hannibal the one of the the sequel to Silence of the Lambs films, which is kind of a terrible movie, and you wonder like what happened, you know, and then even like what he did with trying to kind of reboot the whole Alien franchise, especially An Alien Prometheus. I don't know that movie has grown on me. I kind of do like that movie more, but like a movie like Covenant, it's not a great movie, but a movie like Covenant is just awful. Like there's no redeeming quality about it, and you just you know, you, you almost don't recognize it to be the same director anymore because of the inconsistency. It's very strange. But Kubrick is one of those guys, one of those rare breeds where you can watch any of his movies and, it, and it's all consistently strong. He still had the fire throughout his entire career and, you know, was willing to take chances and cross different genres, you know, making horror films, making science fiction films, making epic, you know, uh, action movies to a degree, and, and just being able to have that consistency. I think another director that has that consistency is Martin Scorsese. Pretty much everything he's done is just amazing. You know, um, you know, just really, really incredible. So it's pretty rare. I think even Quentin Tarantino is up there with having just an incredible body of work for the most part, you know, with the exception of maybe Death Proof, which is not a very good movie. But you know, it's a pretty rare thing. And I think Kubrick, to me, that's what always put him ahead of the pack because of his consistency. And the movie I, I always go back to and that I've seen the most, and it's a movie that's probably talked about the most, it's one of definitely one of his most popular movies. It might be Kubrick's most popular movie, is The Shining, starring Jack Nicholson. Um, and again, like I said, when I was thinking about doing a show on The Shining, I'm like, okay, what else can I add to the conversation? Maybe not very much, but because this is my favorite film by my favorite director, um, you know, it's something that 
I need to do and for what it's worth. But this movie obviously was based on Stephen King's The Shining. And, you know, there's a there's a whole, like, there's been that controversy for many years and still continues where, you know, how Stephen King regarded the movie, the adaptation of The Shining. And he really is very dismissive, never really liked Kubrick's vision. He really has always dismissed the movie. He never gave it any credibility. Kind of always has always shit on that movie, basically. And I've seen interviews and things with Kubrick of where he basically felt, you know, the concept of the book was good. But he felt there was a lot of fat and a lot of just, you know, just a lot of crap in the book that didn't need to be there. And he basically chopped up the story and cut all the fat out and cut all the crap out and took... And took those, the real good, the real meat and potatoes of the story and made a full-length feature out of that. And I think it's, you know, one of those rare things of where the movie is way better than a book. I, I'm not a, I'm not really, I, I like some of Stephen King's things quite a bit. I think there's a thing around his stuff and a lot of his books where I feel like you know, again, he's he's an icon in horror, but I feel like there's also this thing of where I feel like he's a little bit overrated and a little, a little overly hyped sometimes. And I think uh, The Shining, for for instance, is one of those examples. It's like the book is really, really silly and goofy. It's you know there, and I think what Kubrick did with the way he orchestrated the idea to, to create a movie was just another example of his sheer brilliance as a visionary. Just amazing. Just amazing. And one of the coolest things about I have I have a really good Blu ray edition of this and it and it's a it's just an amazing package. It comes with like hours of special features. And uh it's 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 one of my favorite it's one of my favorite uh, collection of special features cuz on on the disc there's an interview with uh, or a documentary that was made by Stanley Kubrick's daughter that was basically she was on set and recorded everything that was going on um, and of course the movie stars Jack Nicholson, Shelley Duvall, Danny Lloyd, Scatman Crothers, you know, just just an amazing movie. One of the most haunting, and I think one of truly one of the most frightening movies. This movie, I've seen this movie so many freaking times I've lost count. And I remember the first time I saw this movie as a kid, it just terrified me. Terrified me. Just the atmosphere of, alone of how the framing of a shot will play out. It's just terrifying. Totally haunting. Like one of those movies that's so primal that like gets under your skin. One of the greatest horror movies ever made. Um, in the documentary, it's it's really interesting and kind of hard to watch, but Kubrick was known uh, for being really, you know, really, really, um, well, it might be, an understatement, but really intense on set where he would really, you know, rail his actors and sometimes do, you know, a hundred takes of one scene and he would just drive everyone insane because he wanted perfection. And if, you know, he was a genius and if, if people were not seeing what he was seeing, he, he would not, uh, compromise in any way, shape or form. And in the documentary, you see Kubrick when he's working with Shelley Duvall on set for The Shining. I mean, he really lays it into her, and it's kind of hard to watch. And and she, at one point, he like breaks her emotionally, and she's like crying on the screen. And it's intense. It's intense. But the other thing that's so interesting she also talks a lot about in the documentary of like it was emotionally the hardest thing she ever went through but she also felt it was also the one of the greatest the greatest thing she ever went to because she realized at the end of the day after going through all of this 
all of this crap that this film was a masterpiece and what he got out of her performance was the best thing she ever did and he re she always regarded and in, even in this interview even though he just totally like you know was like brutal to her in so many ways she felt that was their, her greatest performance and she would you know work with him again they never did work together again but she felt she had such respect for him so she had all of these a great all of these great wonderful things to say about him and to me even though he was such an extreme uh kind of madman to a degree on set he you know had all of this respect from all of the actors and they all like felt like that Kubrick is, was a true visionary, you know, kind of from another planet. And that they felt like at the end of the day, you know, his call was always right. And his, his vision was always the true vision of what the story needed to be or and, and then what it w would become. There was a, a really funny, well, it, it is... It, pretty ridiculous but there was a documentary that came out a few years ago called room 132 and that title is taken uh, out of the out of the uh the shining which is the notorious room of where jack nicholson's character uh goes to this room and there's this like demon or ghost in this by this old woman and it's one of the most frightening things and she's in the shower and he opens up the door and at first, she's this incredibly beautiful woman, and it, and she like seduces him. But then she realizes he realizes that she's like this rotting corpse, and it's one of the most frightening scenes ever on on screen, I think. And um, but there's a documentary that was called that was called 132, and it was named after that that room number. And in this documentary, they had a bunch of different people who were uh you know these like supposed intellectuals or people that worked in films or docu documentaries critics and they were talking about how they felt you know a lot of his films but especially the shining had all these like uh social messages in in, in the story and that it was layered and there were, there were all these references to you know the social things that were going on or pop culture and that it was a very uh, a, a, a kind of to a degree like a film that had a, a heavy use of like propaganda, and that there were all all of these like secret kind of messages in this movie in The Shining. And no, this documentary was all about that and all about exploring that. And I just always thought that that was just. Uh, kind of a bunch of horse shit and was ridiculous and there's this really interesting thing they give and in the film they give all they show all of these scenes and they say that it references you know childhood trauma or that it, it references you know uh, the Vietnam War or you know things that were going on in Washington at the time uh, racism class warfare uh, you name it and they go into each scene seeing well this is what this means this means that this is a you know a Kubrick's commentary on on uh, democracy or blah 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 and it, it's just like so ridiculous and then at one point it's so funny because they interview one of Kubrick's uh, main men who worked with Kubrick who worked with Kubrick on The Shining and he was like an assistant cameraman he was on set pretty much on all of Kubrick's films Kubrick's films and then worked on The Shining um, you know all the time and one of these guys these, you know and i kind of look at them as being kind of these conspiracy theorist uh based guys like people who who like part of the loose change crowd that believe that 9 11 was an inside job and you know and believe that there's like some kind of dark lizard uh cult running things you know you know behind the shadows and all this bullshit and so i always felt like this is kind of how these filmmakers come across as like kind of part of this part of that kind of thing 
And I remember one of the, 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 a couple of the, these guys, the filmmakers, asked this guy who, who was giving this panel talk about The Shining and Kubrick. And, you know, and the guy that, that they ask, he just, he dismisses everything that they said. He said, Kubrick at no time in any way, shape, or form in any of his films, but especially The Shining, had any kind of alter, you know, some any kind of motive of throwing in, you know, some kind of propaganda. Uh, you know, he never tried to bring this this scheme of using propaganda in his film. He didn't. He never at one point had some kind of alter, ulterior motive to talk about various injustices in the world in his film, and it, it wasn't intentionally layered to to uh, you know mean this or mean that. He's like, no, that that's all bullshit. He's like, no, Kubrick at the end of the day was a genius and he was a visionary and he made a movie that is a masterpiece. That's it. And I just thought he completely dismisses everything that these guys are saying in this documentary. And I've always felt that way. I've always felt that way. But it's an amazing uh, film. The documentary is terrible. I wouldn't waste, waste, waste your time. But The Shining is to me remains the greatest Kubrick movie. Again, they're all masterpieces, but Kubrick Kubrick did something really special. And especially being that it's a horror film. And most of the videos that I do on this channel are are all horror films for the most part. So I needed to do a show on The Shining. It's just an amazing film. And uh if you have never seen this, then you have serious problems. So, but this is Jason Dean. Thanks again for supporting this channel. And, uh, you know, keep subscribing and commenting on the videos. And we will see you next time. Peace.